Hey everybody, my name is Ian. I work at the Fort Worth Public Library and today we're going to be doing our Maker Showcase interview. Remember that we do the Maker Showcase interviews every second Saturday of the month and I'm so excited because today we have Krista McCrimmon who is not your typical maker and I say that a lot on this show but really this time I promise you she's not your typical maker. Hey Krista, how are you doing? I'm fantastic, thank you. How are you? I'm so I'm great. Thank you so much for asking. And I'm really excited to talk to you because I do say it seems like every month, oh, here's another unusual maker. But this time, I really feel like we have an unusual <laughs> maker. Tell us a little bit about your maker skill. So I am a copywriter and I don't mean like copyright law, which is what everyone always assumes when you first say that uh, it's copywriting as in advertising copywriting. So when it comes to making an ad, whether that's a commercial, a print ad, a social media post, I'm the person in charge of the words. And it sounds like we are surrounded by copyright all day long. And again, not the copyright of copyright laws, but it, I mean, I watch TV and I see commercials. I go onto the internet and I see tweets. I see a, a lot of different things. So tell us a little bit more like what all that encompasses. So if you want to break it down to like the most base example, I always say when it comes to an ad or any form of communication from a brand or a company, there's the pictures and there's the words and I'm the words, right? But what it really entails is that I work with a creative partner who's an art director, and we work together to create a concept for a client or a brand. And then whatever that overarching idea concept is, we break that down into different communication forms. Is it a radio commercial? Is it a TV commercial? Um, is it something crazy like going out and painting the side of the building in the middle of the night with a message and hope that we don't get in trouble for permitting? You know, it can be all sorts of interesting things depending on what the client lets you do. Um, so while it's easiest to say like, I write the headlines, what it really is about is coming up with really creative conceptual ideas that can be told as stories in a lot of different media um, so that it reaches different audiences and gets different people interested in the brand or the product. Wow, that's awesome. And uh, uh, disclaimer, kids, don't just go out and paint random buildings in the middle of the night. Um, but you know, that's, <laughs> that's really interesting. And um, let's backtrack a little bit. What is your degree in and how does your degree, did it lead into this or is this completely like out of left field for you? No, this is actually very much in line with what I wanted to do sort of growing up. I actually wanted to be a journalist originally, um, but uh, I got into art and design when I was in high school. And so then I thought, okay, well, I would love to do something in that sort of more typically maker creative field, right? So I went to school at the University of North Texas for a program called Communication Design. It's what it sounds like. It's designing things that communicate with the public. Um, the way my program worked, we did all of the art and we did all of the writing as well. And as I was going through the program, I realized not only was I better at the writing part, but I also enjoyed it more. So I graduated with a portfolio. Um, the cool lingo is to call it your book, even though it's not a novel. Um, so I graduated with a portfolio where I had written and designed everything. And so I just applied for writer jobs versus um, uh, art director jobs and was fortunate enough to be hired right out of school and the rest is history. <laughs> That's so cool. Let's back up even further. As a okay. kid, is this kind of what you were wanting to do or is there like, what did you want to be when you grew up? I, you know, I just wanted to, to write, uh, you know, I, I didn't know sort of what all of the options were when I was little. So when I was a little, little kid, I thought I would write books someday. When I was in middle school, junior high, uh, the beginnings of high school, I started thinking, well, maybe I'll be a journalist. You know, I just, I wanted to, to put words on paper. That's really what excited me. Obviously I'm a verbose person, <laughs> you know, language is kind of my thing. Um, when I really started thinking about journalism, it was like, you know, I don't know if I want to be a war correspondent overseas. I don't think I'm quite cut out for that kind of thing. So I looked into different avenues of sort of creating and storytelling. And uh, as I had mentioned, when I went to school, to design school, um, very much, if anyone's involved in these maker series, they know that design is a form of storytelling. Um, so it was sort of a, a, a natural progression to just lean more towards the actual words part of it. Um, but it's still, it's just, it's communicating. It's telling a story to people um, through an ad. Absolutely. As you've been going and creating all sorts of things, um, 
forgive me, but I'm still a little curious about what it means to like, does the company come to you and they say, we want these subjects and you think about how to create the words for it or do they bring the words to you and you just add add more to like kind of talk about that if you would so i work at um and this is the most typical route so i'll give you like the most typical route of how you, this field works is i work at an advertising agency uh, a place might call themselves a branding agency or a marketing agency they might be specific to we're a digital agency but the overarching thing is it's an advertising agency and we have certain clients those clients um, may reach out to us because of work that they've seen and they like it and they say, we want you to do that kind of cool stuff for us. Or they may put out um, just basically a call for people to approach them with creative ideas and then they select an agency from there. So whatever, whatever avenue uh, it brings the two together, once a client and an agency choose to work together, then they decide what communication they're trying to tell. So if it's a, let's say it's a hamburger restaurant, are we doing um, general ads that say, hey, this is a great hamburger restaurant, or do they need a promotion where we're saying, hey, these hamburgers are $1.99 on Wednesdays? <laughs> or do they want us to create um, a new brand story where we want a mascot who can shill hamburgers? So it's basically uh, taking the brand or the product, breaking it down into what communication they need to tell at that particular time, and then putting the creative team on it to, to uh, build that story out. The client will say, we need billboards, TV commercials, and social media posts. Or they might say, we don't know how to tell this story. Can you guys give us the best idea of what you think is gonna reach people? So it's collaborative. The best relationships are collaborative in that way between an agency and a client. That's so cool. Now, somebody might hear this and we kind of, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but somebody might hear this and go like, well, is that really a maker? So what would you say to them that, and kind of tell them, yes, I am a maker because of what I do. So it, you can actually think of it in a, in a couple of different ways. In one capacity, we're making advertisements. You can pick up a magazine and see a thing that I have made. Um, am I the one who's running it through the printing press? No, <laughs> but it's still my idea that's on paper, my partner's idea that's on paper. Um, so we are making a physical advertisement. But what's sort of the, the loftier and the more interesting way of looking at it is that we're making an impression or a mindset. Um, you know, advertising can get a little bit of a bad rap sometimes because people think, you know, are you just trying to sell me overpriced hamburgers? To go back to that example. Um, but, you know, one of my clients is a higher education client. So it's, selling people on the idea of what the best education is going to be for them or what the best school is going to be for their children who are graduating high school and going to college. So even though when we think of advertising, we think of sort of the you know things on the shelf that you buy, um, really it's a touch point that is in a, a lot broader than people realize. Also doing pro bono work for charities and things like that um, kind of keeps you feeling a little bit better about what you're doing, but yes, that got a little rambly, but I do like to say that what I'm making is an impression or a mindset, um, for how people look at a brand or a product or a service. Absolutely. And, and yeah, you're totally right. There, there is a maker talent in this. And it's also, you talked a little bit about collaboration. It sounds like you do a lot of collaboration, not only with the, the brand you're working with or the company that you're working with, but also other designers as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most agencies you work in a partnership, so a copywriter will work with an art director. It doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to have a dedicated person you always work with, but all of the best ideas throughout history in any capacity come from multiple people getting together and kind of throwing ideas at the wall to see what sticks. Um, it's not a solo process. The more you can talk through things and say, um, any idea that comes into your brain and not be judged and not judge other people on, you know, nobody says, well, that's a silly idea. It's like, okay, yeah, that's weird, but what can we do that makes it relevant to this product? You know, it's kind of a safe space, the concepting room. Um, but yeah, it's, it's getting a, a bunch of creative minds in a room together and working together to come up with something that the world hasn't really seen or heard yet. Yeah. And you bring this to a really good point about feedback, because as a maker myself, 
I go out and I look for feedback and sometimes I get feedback that I wasn't quite ready for either. So uh, it's important, feedback is an important part of the making process. And I like hearing that nobody is tearing each other apart whenever they're giving that feedback. Can you talk a little bit more about what it's like to get feedback and how to, how to handle that? Sure, so um, I'm a creative director, which means I have been uh, doing this job since dinosaurs roamed the earth. I've worked my way up the ranks. Um, so, uh, you know, it's easier for me to not take things personally. When you're starting out in this career, it's really difficult to hear some of the feedback, even when people are being really nice. The way I try to um, tell people working on my team how to deal with that sort of emotional reaction to having people critique work that you've made that you love is that you should take everything passionately, but you shouldn't take it personally. You're getting critique on something you're, you made. You're not getting critique on who you are as a person. And anyone who has any sort of creative uh, proclivities knows that that's a difficult separation. So that's kind of my approach is I can be really upset or frustrated that the idea isn't alive, but it's not a, an indication of my character as someone who is a creative person. Yeah, feedback is hard as a designer and maker myself. It's always hard to get feedback. And sometimes somebody's trying to really be nice and, and give you true and honest feedback, but they just may not know how to put it in the best words. And so it can be, it can be quite hard sometimes. Well, and I'm sure you've heard the term ugly baby syndrome, where you make this thing and it's your baby and you love it. And someone else, you pull the blanket back and they go, oh boy, <laughs> but you put so much into it and you love it unconditionally that you kind of can't see that um, objective view. So it's, it's tough, but it gives you a thick skin. Yeah, for sure. And especially when I was a lighting designer for theaters here in the Dallas Fort Worth area, getting critiqued on my work was not always the easiest hearing those reviewers come in and some of them tearing apart my work, which was not easy, but you know, it, it helps us grow and we, we definitely learn from it. And not everything they say is always right. We always have to take it with a grain of salt, but it is important to be able to, to use that information and move forward with it as we create more things in the future. It's a subjective thing. And that makes it really difficult because um, what one person loves, another person is going to rip to shreds. And that's just the nature of working in a subjective business. Yeah, for sure. Um, what has been your favorite project that you've been able to work on so far and, and what made it so special for you? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, <sighs> So a project that I was extremely proud of working on was we worked on the Boy Scouts of America and we didn't do any giant brand campaign for them. What we worked on was the initiative to let girls start joining the Boy Scouts. And, you know, I've done cool TV commercials and big campaigns, but the thing that I'm so proud of for this uh, is three words, which is scout me in. They used Scout Me In as the hashtag and the tagline for the inclusion of girls in the Boy Scouts. And um, just a little bit of a story, I was watching, this was a few years ago, a 4th of July parade with my kids and the Boy Scouts came by and there were some girls in the Boy Scouts and they were saying, Scout Me In, Scout Me In, as they were walking through my little neighborhood parade. And to have the impact in that capacity and see little girls so excited and so proud to be part of this institution, that for me was a huge win. That was so much bigger than seeing a TV commercial that I made because it was, um, it was sort of the spiritual manifestation of like lifting little girls up in the world. And that felt pretty fantastic. Wow. That's so awesome to, to see your work kind of right there in front of you and see it manifest. It was goosebumps because it was, you know, I'm a feminist and I'm a humanist. And it was so fantastic to seeing these, these little girls so proud of the fact that they could break that barrier and for them to be saying three words that I wrote. I just, I was like, I could retire today. I'd be fine. <laughs> That's so awesome. So we talked about your biggest success and what, what, what you said you could retire from now because you, you were so excited about it. What happens when things don't go quite the way you want them to? And how do you recover from something that may not have landed very well? Um, it's difficult, but the more you get used to um, 
failing and I air quote that because I don't even love considering it a failure, but the more that you get used to that, the easier it becomes to process it. Um, in this business, uh, 90% of what I do never sees the light of day because you present multiple conceptual ideas in every meeting and then multiple executions of how that could come to life. So it's this funnel that starts here and gets narrowed all the way down to here and everything else just, it's like, nice knowing you, thanks for helping, see you never, <laughs> you know, so it just sort of disappears. Um, so you, you sort of get used to that aspect of not everything being a winner. However, when you think you're presenting something that's going to go over gangbusters and the client looks at you and goes, you completely missed the mark. What were you thinking? You have to take that moment go back to that, take it passionately, but don't take it personally and synthesize those emotions into not getting defensive, but instead um, taking steps towards proactively getting to a place where you and the client can agree on something. It is not easy. It is not fun, <laughs> but you really can't have that emotional reaction. As someone with no poker face, it's a lot of practice <laughs> for me. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, well, that's probably, I think that probably covers without me rambling more. <laughs> Did that answer the question? Yeah, no, that was great. Okay. That was really perfect. Um, yeah, I definitely don't have a very good poker face. I've been working on that for a long time and it's just, I tend to wear my heart out on my sleeves. It happens, okay. but uh, it's interesting. I, something that I kind of picked up in that, it sounds like as you're going through this process, you're only almost distilling these ideas because you're getting them from this wide swath of ideas down to this very narrow and pure type of, of concept and idea. So it's, it sounds like it's a practice in, in widening down to, to really distill that idea into its, its most essential form, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, um, it's sort of self-editing at the appropriate time. You don't want to do that when you're first beginning working on something, you want every idea on the wall. Then you take a step back literally and physically or literally and, uh, figuratively and cold medicine. Um, <laughs> so yes, it's taking all of those ideas, not self-editing from the very beginning, but taking a step back literally and figuratively and saying what's really working, what's really not, what do I think is really funny, but doesn't actually meet the criteria of the project, you know, and being able to make those decisions um, for yourself so that you're delivering not just something that you think is really cool, but something that's really what the client is needing to um to sell the product or the service or the idea. So you kind of mentioned that uh, some ideas are funny. I It just hit me that not all ideas are serious or not all ideas are funny. There's a, there's a full spectrum of emotions that you're kind of working through, right? In the course of my career, I've worked on some very serious clients. I've also sold chicken fingers. Um, <laughs> I have worked on financial accounts that are very much in the weeds of lingo and business. I've worked on insurance, um, but I've also done really fun stuff for a local comedy house. Um, I've worked on ice cream campaigns. So it runs the gamut, um, which is why it's really important to have a lot of different life experiences and have a lot of different things to draw from so that you can speak to those people, speak about those different things um, and not feel like you are a one note writer or a one note creator. Wow, I hadn't even thought about all the different emotional spectrum that you need to kind of have in your tool bag to be able to pull from for all these different campaigns and everything that you're doing. So that's that's really interesting to me. Um, speaking of being able to pull from uh, inspiration, is there somebody that inspires you and kind of helps, has been a mentor or guided you through this process? Um, books. I realize books are not a person and I realize it's a very basic answer. But um, I, I always say that good writers have a very distinct voice. Great writers can speak in any voice. Um, it's, and so when people are talking about how they can get into the business or what they should do to prepare as a junior copywriter or, or interning even, I always say to read anything you can get your hands on. Copywriters are readers. You wanna read different genres from different voices, different cultures, different orientations, different viewpoints, different political backgrounds, 
I want you to read Anna Karenina, and then I want you to pick up Us Weekly <laughs> and just take any, you know, all of those different voices and languages and viewpoints. Um, the more of those that you absorb, then the more you'll be able to communicate across a broader spectrum and the more you'll understand um, the, the mindsets of the people that you're speaking to or speaking about. So while I've had great mentors in the industry as far as my creative directors and things, the biggest influence has just been heading to the library and picking up a, a, a good gamut of books and just, you know, curling up and reading. That's so awesome. I mean, we, I do work for the library, so I'm a little biased for libraries, but that's it's always important to read no matter what career field or even who you are. It's important to read. Um, so besides reading, if somebody's interested in becoming a copywriter or even a, a writer, what, what kind of um, tools or what do you suggest that they do? I guess if someone's interested in becoming a writer, aside from just reading, which is a big thing for me, it's journaling is great. Um, writing poetry is fantastic. Putting jokes on paper is phenomenal. But at the same time, seek out people who write. If there's someone who's a novelist who you think is amazing, reach out to their email address and see if they will respond to you. Go up to the journalism school or to the local newspaper and reach out to people and say, this is something that I'm really interested in. How can I get my start? Um, look into the schools around you that have marketing or journalism or creative writing classes, community classes, things like that. You know, it's with so many jobs and careers these days, you have to have this incredibly technical mindset. Really, at the end of the day, I can do my job with a pen and a piece of paper, and that's pretty darn cool. So as long as you're willing to just put thoughts on paper and articulate what you're thinking in different ways, then you're going to have a head start on a lot of people. Yeah, definitely. And just like any uh, painter or watercolorist or, or, or artist, it's important to just do it every day, right? Just keep writing, write how you're feeling, write what you're doing, just, just write. Mm -hmm. Sing it, make it a poem, dance around your house while you're playing with words. It sounds so dorky and it is, but it's just one of those things where the more um, sort of intimately involved you become with the English language, the more uh, creative ideas you're going to have down the line. I also tell people to make sure that they go out in the world and have a wide variety of experiences. If you've never ice skated, go ice skating. Someday that's going to end up in, in an ad that you're doing. Um, it doesn't have to be anything crazy. You don't have to jump out of an airplane. Go talk to somebody you wouldn't have talked to before. When you're giving, you know, a guy on the street corner a dollar, ask him a couple questions and get to know him and get his viewpoint and, and you know, learn from people um, because everybody has a really different story to tell. And when you are then speaking to those people later, having had those experiences with them in, in the first place is going to really make you successful. That's so awesome. Yeah, I, I, that's amazing to me and such a great, a great perspective to have for just about anybody, I feel. Yeah, I, you know, people are fascinating. Human nature is the most fascinating thing on the planet. And the more you can interact with people who aren't like you, who don't look like you, who don't live in the same um, uh, wealth bracket as you do, um, just the more people you can talk to, the better perspective you're going to have on the world. And I sort of want to back up a little bit because I don't want it to sound like I'm saying you can then capitalize on those experiences for your career. That's not what I'm saying. If you're working on a big corporate brand, let's say it's a chain restaurant and you kind of feel like, well, I'm writing ads for a chain restaurant. Am I really doing any good? Well, you know, at the end of the day, if you have a, a promotion for, let's go back to the hamburgers. If you have a promotion for a hamburger at a chain restaurant and there's a single father who's working a second shift and people come in and buy that hamburger and he makes extra money and bigger tips because of that promotion, then what you're doing is helping that person get his kid's school uniform or take him to see, you know, a basketball game or just make sure that they have food on the table. So you can distill it down and realize that even though it might feel like a big corporate job, um, you're helping people at the base level um, in some capacity. 
wow, my mind is just blown by <laughs> what you have, have kind of connected the dots for me. That's really amazing. And I never, I, I didn't think about it that way, but that's, that's incredible. Well, Krista, thank you so much for joining me today. It seems like these Maker Showcase interviews always end up in this really deep place. And I love that because we don't really think about how um, everything is connected and all that. And so having these interviews are great. If people want to find you, is there a place that they can find you online? Sure. Where people can find me and actually see my work is at my personal portfolio website, which is kristamccrimmon.com. I will spell that. It's K-R-I-S-T-A-M-C-C-R-I-M-M-O-N.com. So once you type that in eight years later, when you're finished typing that name, you can see some of my work and um, my contact info is on there. I'm happy to ask or answer any questions that anyone wants to ask me. Awesome. I hope I hope our audience reaches out to you if they're interested in writing and copyright and see if we can get some uh, great questions from them. Again, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, yeah, thanks for, for chatting with me today. Thank you so much for having me. This was wonderful. And I'm really excited to be a part of it. Absolutely. All right. We will see you next time. Remember, the Maker Showcase is every second Saturday. So we'll see you next month. Bye, everyone.